Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to our weekly talk show, Talking Point. I am your host, Sayyid Niaz Ahmed. Today in our studio, we have a university professor, a photographer, a curator, a human rights champion, a writer, a visiting lecturer at some of the world's very famous universities like Cambridge, Oxford, UCLA and Stanford. And if you thought that I have got a group of guests today in our studios, you couldn't be farther from the truth. We have with us Dr. Shahid Al Alam. As I said before, he would like to be known as a curator, a photographer and a writer. He doesn't need introduction, but one has to go through the motions. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shahid Al Alam. How Good are you to today? Good to be here. Good to meet you again. I mean, well, good to meet you too. And uh, that despite very heavy a schedule today and day after and day after tomorrow, you have made time for us. And despite the technical glitch that we had <laughs> today, we faced where two heads always make something much better. So while you are here, your presence has helped us solve the problem. The pleasure uh, was mine entirely. Well, what, what brings you to London this time? Um, several things, actually. Um, I'm running a workshop tomorrow at Rich mm -hmm. Mix uh, mm -hmm. for youth here in the UK. And it's part of a much longer program we are trying to develop between Rich Mix and Drake, looking to see how the diaspora community can be right. engaged with what's happening in their home countries. But I'm primarily running a workshop on storytelling. Right. Uh, you said uh, Drick, uh, just for the benefit of our mm. viewers who do not understand sure. whether Drick is a car or a bus. <laughs> <laughs> so what is Drick? Well, the word Drick is a Sanskrit word. It's, um, it means vision, mm -hmm. uh, inner vision. And mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. the word we chose to represent an agency. Um, mm -hmm. It's an independent media organization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which primarily is a platform for indigenous storytellers, in this case from Bangladesh, but we also have a branch called Majority World, which represents storytellers in Latin America and Africa and the Middle Eastern mm -hmm. countries and of course Asia. So it's a Bangladeshi organization which in September was 25 years old. You're great. Um, and has now played a very, very important role in providing an, alt an alternative source of storytelling. Right, see. Is it in uh, Bangla language? We communicate in the language of media. Mm -hmm. So images primarily, moving images, still images. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, it's supported by text and audio, both in Bangla mm -hmm. and in English. And in fact, translated to many countries, uh, in to many languages. Great, great. Uh, what does it take a London University professor to decide to go back to his country and uh, do the nation building, take part in the nation building process, or rather to to give it a voice to the unheard majority. I understand there was, you, you had a personal experience back in 1985 in uh, Belfast, and yeah. that triggered... <laughs> yes, that, that the, is a story. The later... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but was, I'll first go, go back to your earlier question in the sense that going back to Bangladesh was never an issue. Mm -hmm. I was always going to, that is my home, mm -hmm. that is where I'm from. In fact, it was coming to Britain uh, right. That, you know, it happened at a particular time in my history, in my youth, and I came for higher education, but I was always going to go back. It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what I was going to do when I went back, that was the issue. I'm from a middle class home and I've been brought up in the way in which many middle class young men are brought up to enter into respectable professions. I felt, um, in terms of my own passion, in terms of what I could achieve, that perhaps Bangladesh needed a media person far more than it needed yet another research chemist. <laughs> so that determined the choice of what I was going to do. Right. Going back to Bangladesh was never an issue. Mm -hmm. But to come back to your question, it was actually a bit later than that, 89. Mm -hmm. I was having a, a, a show in Belfast and I was staying with friends in Newry, a town, small town, very close to Belfast. And my friends, Paddy and De Deborah, very dear Irish friends, uh, they had a lovely five-year-old daughter called Karina. So Karina's room was emptied out. She, she moved in with her parents to make room for Uncle Shahidal. <laughs> now, 
I love kids. And Karina is a lovely kid. We were very dear friends. Uh, and we'd spend time chatting, telling stories to each other. I came back from town one day and I was emptying out my pockets. And Karina was standing at the doorway. Usually, when she sees me, she rushes into my arms and we tell each other stories. Mm -hmm. That day, she stood at that doorway, looking at me with a very strange expression. I sort of asked her, what's the matter, Karina? She said, you've got money. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I've got money. She said, but, but you're from Bangladesh. This little five-year-old girl could make it fit. I mean, her parents, her <laughs> father certainly used to work with concern. They, they had projects in Bangladesh. They helped Bangladeshis mm -hmm. who were in difficult situations. And that was what Korean knew. Mm -hmm. And it got me wondering about what sort of a social, cultural environment a little girl grew up in where she was incapable of seeing a Bangladeshi as anything other than an icon of poverty. <laughs> so that was really what Drik began to try and right. change. The, the fact that we recognized that our image was being created and propagated by largely white Western photographers who had a particular agenda in most cases. Uh, and they came over with particular editorial briefs, went back with stereotyped images, and those were the images that determined our identity. Mm -hmm. And I felt that unless we become our own storytellers, that identity will never change. There's a very interesting African saying. It goes something like, until the lions find their storytellers, stories about hunting will always glorify the hunter. True, true. And essentially that is I the case. I remember you quoting this yeah. uh, in my last interview. With yeah, you. there you are. I say it again because it's, it's something it's that I... It, not only that, I, I think one needs to be reminded of it constantly because in this world where representation accounts for so much, mm -hmm. we are constantly being represented by others. And I think that needs to shift. As they would like to see us. Exactly, as it fits, as is convenient for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it is up to us. To, the onus is upon us to take charge of our own storytelling. But, but, but are, we, are we united in, in uh, when I say we means... We, members of a society and the, the members of the ordinary population of, the, of a country, uh, are we united in, in projecting an image that uh, everybody likes or, or is it just like uh, uh, one particular group, one particular party? As always, there are many agendas. Mm -hmm. It depends upon who is doing it, whose interest is involved. Um, and there will be a multiplicity of voices. I don't actually have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. I think a plurality of voices is healthy, it's necessary. I think my own point of view needs to be challenged, needs to be questioned, and I need to be made accountable. I, I th I'm fine with all of that. Right. It's the fact that the West has, to a large extent, held monopoly over our storytelling. Mm -hmm. That has been the problem, and that is what we're trying uh, to challenge. Uh, was it, uh, I'm sure it was perhaps, but uh, was it because uh, they had the technical know-how, they had the photographers, they... They, they would carry cameras and go to our countries and then take pictures and sell it to uh, the, the best buyers? To an extent, yes. Um, well, it's a, a number of reasons. One, certainly media relative to us has been controlled by them. So whoever controls the media controls what the story goes out. Right. Um, also, it has been, sadly, part of it has to do with donor agencies, NGOs, who have had a need for fundraising, who have needed to propagate a particular image in order for their own survival. So their survival has taken precedence of ours. And while they have a need to do what they do, um, this patron-client relationship between yeah. us and them is also something that has needed to be maintained in order for them to continue playing uh, in that I, I would like to share something. I'm sure you are aware of that, that come uh, Ramadan uh, in this country uh, or say the time of uh, Eid al-Adha, the, the, when we slaughter uh, and offer sacrifices. Uh, uh, there are so many charities uh, and they're running uh, schools and madrasas and, and uh, orphanages back home. 
and they keep showing us the pictures of uh, unfinished uh, buildings uh, under construction, children sitting uh, on floor uh, trying to read or write or uh, in abject poverty. See. And, and this image goes out every night mm -hmm. see, and people in this country uh, who feel like they should do something, they they'd contribute 10 pound, 100 pound and 50 pounds, whatever, see, that is a card, the charity, the poor do. And this goes on. And so, so, so this image, you see, of uh, Bangladesh suffering, uh, uh, children sitting on floor, uh, oh, there are no tube wells, uh, scarcity of water, medicine, mm. food, education, and all that, see. While I understand that there are NGOs and, and other organizations, uh, in addition to the government's uh, work, that they are trying to build a, an educated society. The health workers are there, uh, people offering uh, loans uh, to housewives and, and other small business uh, men who can go and start on their own. But all this image, you see, of, of coming out from Bangladesh destroys the whole thing. Yeah. And I think that is where your drink plays an important role. Uh, well, I hope it's about to change, but. I'll give you an example. There, there was a, a friend of mine, Father Paul Kasberg, a mm -hmm. Sri Lankan priest. He was an economist and he did his master's at LSE many years ago, about 30 years ago. And he came up with a very interesting observation. Mm -hmm. Of course, the figure relates to 30 years ago, so it might change now. But he was calculating that if the price of a cup of tea in British Rail went up by 0.2 pence, mm -hmm and that increased revenue went directly to Sri Lanka, it would generate more income for the Sri Lankan government than the, the total <laughs> foreign aid, than the total foreign aid Sri Lanka received. So the moral of the story, we need better trade terms, not aid. True. But that is something we never provided. Um, we look, I mean, who are the real heroes of Bangladesh? The garment workers, the migrant workers, yes. the farmer in the field. Yes. They're the people who really true, keep us true, going. True. If the garment worker mm -hmm. was paid a little bit more than they're paid now, it would gen generate massive amounts of income for Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Yet that is where the screws are applied. They're paid as little as they might possibly be to maintain the low rates at this end. On the other hand, there is still aid being given mm -hmm. under terms, under specific conditions. Um, and on a donor-driven agenda. But, but you, one thing I think uh, is not mentioned is the owners of the government factories, they're making huge profits. The owner's making profits, the government's making a profit. Yeah. It's the poor worker who's yes. getting screwed. Um, but uh, here I must uh, bring up certain things. I think it is in the interest of Bangladesh for the government industry to do well, both the owners and the workers, because you know, it is an industry, right. it's a thriving industry, it brings in 76% of Bangladesh's foreign revenue. So I'm certainly not in favor of either shutting down the garment industries or undermining the industry itself. I think it, it should be run in an equitable way True. so the worker gets a fair wage and they have, they're treated like human beings. And I think the foreign buyers need to be made accountable for the conditions that they allow in order to extract as mm -hmm. much profit as they do. Um, and there again, you know, better trade terms, equitable sharing of wealth is something that is in everyone's benefit. But that, that is one happens. point. You talked about the foreign, uh, foreign buyers, you see. But what about our own factory owners, you see? Completely culpable, though I must admit that it's not uniform across the board. There are a whole range of garment factories. Some are well run. And in fact, that should be one of the examples. There are garment factories that are well run, that treat their workers well and are profitable. Right. So it can be done. It can be done, yes. Yeah? And I think those should be the examples that are to be followed. And on the one hand, while we talk about Rana Plaza, while we talk about Tanzim fashions and the horrendous stories that are, yep. that are rightly to be critiqued, I think we should also be mm -hmm. telling the stories mm -hmm. of the garment factories that are well run, True. Uh, True. that are profitable, that treat the work as well, and that those are examples we should be following at both ends, both in Bangladesh and in the, in the West. See, see the owners of uh, 
propagating uh, good news uh, really be, uh, is on the government and the industry itself, see, rather than people, ah, oh, this is a wonderful organization. Oh, that's it. That's a one-liner, see. But a disaster is news, see. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so bad news travels mm -hmm. faster, see. And that's where the foreign agencies will know half an inch of columns, see, uh, written about Bangladesh fire, 200 persons died, you see. That carries uh, 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 a more impact, you see, and, and people uh, get up bad impression about uh, how factories are run in Bangladesh rather than a biggest story about uh, a particular government officer goes and somewhere and talks about this or that or, or a new bridge was opened where it was not needed at all, <laughs> where there's no river. So, so I think this positivity that you're talking about, it has to come from within, isn't it? Completely. I mean, the onus is upon us to be telling our stories. And there are wonderful stories to be told. Mm -hmm. There are magical stories about ordinary Bangladeshis doing extraordinary things. Uh, and it is unfortunate, as you say. I mean, uh, I'll go back a little bit. I mean, my own photography, at least the photojournalism that I do, uh, started in the early 80s when I was working, when I, as I was an activist in the streets, mm -hmm. documenting the resistance to President Ishad's uh, autocratic rule. Uh, at that time, we took great risks to photograph a powerful democratic movement. No one was interested in our story. You know, a democratic movement in Bangladesh just wasn't sexy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a few months later, there was the cyclone in April, on the 29th of April, 1991. We got inundated by requests <laughs> for pictures. You know, those are the pictures that they want. To be fair, I remember there was the New York Times at that time wrote to us to say they wanted certain pictures of, of the cyclone. We had those pictures, but we went back to them and said that wasn't a story to be told. We felt the real story was about reconstruction, right. about the tenacity right. of the people, about the resilience of the people, that people, even in those conditions, stood by each other, rooted for one another, and rebuilt their lives. Yep, and they've and survived fact, and they're rebuilt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sure, there are difficult stories about Bangladesh. That is part of our reality. I'm not ignoring that. Mm -hmm. But I think the real story is not the disaster, but the resilience of the people. The f I mean, can you but imagine? the night after the disaster. Yeah, can you imagine, uh, say in Britain, if a fraction of what, happened in, uh, what happens in Bangladesh happened, the nation would be shut down for, for right. whatever. As period. with everything, we have to come to the end of this segment and uh, we'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue with our very interesting discussion. Uh, thank you, viewers, for being with us. Don't go away. We'll be back soon. Thank you.